Hello, friends. It's Chapo. Chapo, let's go. I'm doing the, the old school throwback intro because we're, Lord forgive us, we're back on that bullshit. Back yeah. to our old, uh, the old me. It's the original Drive Blaze only. Just me, Matt, and Felix today. How you doing, boys? We're good. Look, we're not going to spoil you with uh, cold open bits that I wrote that took me as much as you know, three and a half minutes to write in some cases that include high concept bits such as uh, Trump calling Rand Paul gay uh, uh, the other bits where I just, just did Jared Kushner's voice but it didn't sound like him it was just him sounding like a Jew <laughs> I took a long time writing these bits and people didn't really appreciate them so it just it's back to how it is we fired everyone else on the show Brendan isn't even here <laughs> it's the original three no more editing no more cold opens we're not even gonna have the theme music anymore because we don't know how to do it <laughs> Yeah, it's and I am us. once again calling in from a uh, a tin can on a string. <laughs> <laughs> Matt is uh, in a barrel right now. We're all wearing barrels yeah. with suspenders, and when we jump up, you can see our dick. That's <laughs> you know, Lord forgive me, I'm back on my bullshit. We're we're all wearing top hats with the tops popped out. <laughs> <laughs> my big toe is sticking through a boot right now. I was <laughs> big toes I was are sticking out of all of our shoes. I was eating a hot dog and I squeezed it too hard and it landed in a wealthy woman's cleavage. <laughs> I'm being chased around the party by a professor. Matt's uh, back at home, but uh, I am now. We are now for the first time uh, in Felix's new apartment, the Chapo Greenpoint FOB, now fully operational. Uh, we're ready to to run to run ops out, out of yeah. here. Yeah, this is you know a lot of people have made fun of me on uh, Twitter because my TV table, for instance, is a picnic table that has a dirty bed sheet over it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's a discarded pile of jeans next to the electrical outlet. Yeah, okay, yeah, fine. But this is a three thousand square foot. Uh, I have an indoor pool. Of an infinity pool in case somebody gets polio and needs to learn how to walk again, like what happened to FDR. Uh, a radiator slash AC unit that gets way too loud, so it has to be whatever temperature it is outside whenever we record. And I have a desk. And uh, I think it's funny that, uh, you know, people aren't there to see you grind, but when you make it, they're there to hate. I think it's funny that people aren't here to see, like, your floor that's like literally covered in like a broom, bubble wrap, and uh, shoes and garbage. That's called a uh, floor crudité. It's a <laughs> French decorating technique. It's meant to. Okay, so I moved in here two weeks ago. Would you want to record in like sort of an antiseptic environment where things are supposed to be where they are, like we're recording in a hotel room? Or would you like to feel like it always is fault? Because that's true. I put in special effort to completely fuck up where i put things so <laughs> you guys would feel at home when we finally recorded here i had a i had a force of execution a steven seagal movie playing on netflix when you guys came in you're right it's it's it feels like home felix. yeah exactly it feels like home the only difference is i can now jack off at any time of the day i can shit piss shower whatever with my door open even when people are here that's the rules if you if it's your place you can do that well if Those you're... are the best. I just want to say that I recommend to all listeners to watch all of the later era Seagal movies on Netflix because they are some of the best viewing you can watch. Uh, don't bother with his original stuff that was released theatrically. We'll only watch the ones where he has a goatee that looks like he painted a hemorrhoid donut black. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And glued it to his face. It looks like it looks like he dropped a horseshoe in molasses and then rolled it around on a barbershop floor. <laughs> <laughs> like if if it's a Seagal movie that's filmed in the United States, give it a pass. If it's filmed in Hungary, yeah. smash that play button. If you if your if your movie takes place in any nation that had a civil uprising or a puppet government in the last 10 years it's a good one if it has a title like you know maximum maximum operation or uh you know fucking the killing operative the reckoning 
That's a good yeah. one. It's him sitting on an office chair with a gun, and it was filmed in Disputed Transnistria. Yeah. <laughs> I know you've got a good movie. This is the first movie filmed entirely in a demilitarized zone. I was the first Italian. I watched all of the St- Seagal movies, by the way, so I watched Above the Law, which was his first big See, one the other the first day. one. But now, I mean, Nick on Come Down has already talked about it. Uh he just, he sort of sounds like the Billy Crystal jazz man guy. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, uh, Seagal's on the big screen. Uh, the, the floor is a mess. There's nothing on the walls at all. Yes, it's there, just there's completely actually, bare. Yes, um, dog calendar. Oh, there's a dog right calendar. There. <laughs> um, but it feels like home, and uh, it feels like home again because um, no guests, just me, Matt, and Felix, the original, the original trio. We're going to talk about some political bullshit. We're going to talk about what's on the telly. And uh, I got a reading series. So this is, this is Chapo Classic for all you fans and listeners. And maybe some new listeners who uh, aren't as familiar with the, uh, the old format. Yeah. I mean, look, if you started listening because you heard, you know, We Live in the Zone Now with Virgil or you heard the Adam Curtis episode or the Heidecker episode, you're going to hear this. You have already r- realized our horrible, toxic personalities and this, you know, next hour or so is going to confirm that you're never going to listen again. Um, it is illegal to cancel your Patreon subscription at this point. Yeah, though. yeah. No, I mean it is. It's one of those things where it's just like it's breaking U.S. federal law. It's part of NAFTA, actually. That you can't unsubscribe from podcasts. I mean, I, I guess I'd like to uh, uh, begin things this week with. I mean, you know, even though I'm loath to do so. Uh, just, uh, talking about, uh, Donald Trump again, because I mean, I, that really has provided the most fertile ground for discussion this week. And, you know, just in continuing, uh, with our theme, just, um, absolutely continues to baffle me just how fucking stupid everything has gotten so quickly. Like just how unbelievably dumb everything seems like it's, it, it feels new in a way, even though I know that's not true. Even I know in American history has always been sort of like stupid and corrupt. It, like it, it, it feels like something new is happening, and it, it, there's sort of a a queasiness to it. I don't know. Where do you guys want to begin? His press conference, his fucking weird trip to Mar-a-Lago with the Japanese prime minister, Flynn bowing out. I mean, there, there's just been a so much stupid bullshit going on. Oh God. Oh, I fuck. I don't know. I don't even I want to start with Flynn. Okay, let's talk about Flynn because, you know, F- Flynn is a, uh, I guess, friend of the show. Friend of the show, Michael Flynn. He's actually, we, he's now, now, now the seventh Mike on, he's now yeah. our, na- our national security if correspondent. If you're a new subscriber, $4 of your $5 goes to paying Michael Flynn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he resigned this week after three weeks as a national security advisor because of, you know, leaks that he had had contact with uh, the Russian government prior to the election and seemed to imply a kind of quid pro quo. I mean, this is the sort of uh, basically exactly what Henry Kissinger did in 1968 when as a private citizen, he told the Vietnamese government to hold out uh, in the Paris peace talks because they could get a better deal from uh, Nixon. And he did that as a private citizen and then just, you know, was scooped right up by the Nixon administration and became, you know, a high level national security advisor uh, in in that uh, administration as well. However, uh, Flynn doesn't seem like he's going to get away with this. Or I mean, I don't know. He already hasn't. I, I mean, mean, he had to resign. Well, yeah. I mean, he is a he is a hilarious oaf. I mean, this isn't even the first time he's gotten canned for being a huge dipshit. Yeah. I mean, he got yeah, fired he, off the Joint Chiefs of Staff right during Obama for like just coming into offices and like dropping uh, you know pencils on the floor and like knocking things over with his dick and. And uh, like proposing plans to nuke Tehran and stuff like that. I mean, he's yeah, and the he, Napoleon of just getting shit case shit canned for being an idiot. He got canned for a similar thing at DNI. Actually, he leaked the stuff like top classified shit to Australia, and he would always like bring it up. He'd be like, "I would do it again." Oh, dude, fucking again. And it's like, well, he did do it again, kind of. But I want to clarify. Michael Flynn's a total piece of shit. He's a complete Islamophobe who, like, tried to give his fail son a top secret clearance. He's, oh, as Matt alluded to, constantly alluded for or constantly agitated for war with Iran. He's basically a paid agent of AKP as well. But I actually I don't think, look, people may disagree with me here. But I think the actual thing he got canned for 
I mean, he got canned for lying about it, but what, how people are characterizing it, the thing he did talking to the foreign minister about rolling back the sanctions, I don't actually think that was that bad. Like, does, does anyone agree? I don't know. The, uh, the T word, and by that I mean treason, gets thrown around quite, uh, yeah, it's fucking quite frequently. But, you know, I'm, I've always been in favor of treason, so it's hard for me to get, you know, too mad at uh, Michael Flynn for this. But I am glad that uh, he's now resigned and, you know, embarrassed uh, himself and the Trump administration oh, yeah, for one sure. more time. I'm, I'm glad they took a hit. But, like, as far as shit he did, there were things that John Kerry did in, like, the last three months that were, like, as bad or worse as this, if you're going in that direction. I mean, what, what is it when John Kerry talks to the Emir of Qatar and they talk about, like, you know, funding groups that are have pledged allegiance to Al-Qaeda in Syria? I think it's more the idea that he was a private citizen at the time. Yeah, and, and again, yeah, this yeah. is like, again, uh, this is what Kissinger did in 1968. And this is what uh, the Reagan uh, White House or the, his, the Reagan presidential team did in 1980 with the, the hostage crisis that we, you know, that's how Shane Bauer got uh, sent back. That's, to him. that's true, how he was true. freed. Shane is 70. <laughs> He's 70 years old. But yeah, no, I mean, I, I get the norms and laws that he's violating. And also he lied about it, which totally fucked him. This is all part of like this question that I think, you know, I've been asking myself now where like it, it's clear that like, you know, Trump has like nobody is in charge. and oh, They yeah, have yeah. no idea like how to do anything in like the larger workings of American government and bureaucracy. And like the question is like that we need to ask ourselves is would you prefer this insane shit show for four years or would you actually are you looking forward to him getting impeached and uh mike pence and paul ryan and you know psychopaths who actually know how to get things done within the bureaucracy of the american government be in charge i'm not so sure i'm not even saying that like flippantly i have no fucking clue but you know if you were betting now i mean i know we asked is he even going to finish out his first term before just like quitting or fucking dying or something but like is he even going to finish his first year in office i think yeah. is a legitimate question that i'm wondering now uh i i my guess is i could see if the stupid russia shit keeps snowballing and like there's more stuff that comes out and, and there ends up being pressure for some sort of investigation him saying fuck it i'll just i quit uh but i do think that that is really a, dan a dangerous position and there's a lot i think there's a lot more that could go wrong with that happening than would go right just because uh you'd have a situation where people would be so grateful for the return of normalcy that they would be willing to just let yeah let paul ryan and mike pence do whatever monstrous things they have on their agenda uh and you know it's there's a bill to replace Obamacare with David Buster's coupons, they're going to be like, oh, well, you know, at least they know what they're doing. At least they speak the language of Washington. Let's let them do it. Uh, you know, they want to put a Gargamel on the Supreme Court. Well, hey, you know, at least they they speak the language that we're used to. So that is a danger. Um, and I think that the other danger, the thing that f freaks people out, like after that press conference, is that, well, if you let him stay, he's going to do something crazy. Uh, but honestly, I, I just don't think that he has enough of an attention span to really commit to any kind of crazy scheme. I mean, we we can't really overestimate how stupid and and splinkered and TV addled he is. I mean, he is just a Fox News grandpa in the White House. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree with Matt and. This sort of impetus to get him out of there. Like, look, I'm not going to say one thing is more dangerous than the other, but I think parts of having like a Pence or Ryan administration are legitimately horrifying because every the worst things that Trump has done, and obviously there's some horribly evil stuff going on right now, like the ice deep ice roundups and shit that I think would still go on under another administration. And I don't know. I think like liberal there's this like liberal complex on one hand to like to act like trump and bannon are these brilliant geniuses because they built up hillary so much the only thing that could have outsmarted the democrats and outsmarted hillary would be like an evil genius it would be blowfield from james bond right when in reality it's just like he's like a fucking fat retarded cokehead and a reality tv dumbass and it's like okay so what would it ban like with bannon they're like Oh, uh, the Muslim ban was actually a trial balloon for a coup. 
because part of their plan was to get completely demolished by the Ninth Circuit Court and give up. <laughs> like, what the fuck are you talking about? At the end of the day, these are just guys. You know, I don't see this need to return to normalcy if it's at the cost of enacting pretty similar agenda with way more competence. Well, and, and, and another danger in all this is like, uh, you know, if he gets stuck on, on this Russia thing, and again, like, I find it plausible that, that he would, there, there would be something untoward going on between him and Russia. I mean, who the fuck knows? But like, what I worry about is if that's what does him in, then like politically it's it's horrible because it gives the miserable Democratic Party the perfect excuse never to change and just be like, oh, actually we did do everything right, but they cheated. Yeah. So it's not really our fault. Hillary was a great candidate. Our message is fine. We don't need to change anything. It was just Russia, you know? And like, I'm sorry, that's not why she lost. And like nothing that's come out since then has convinced me otherwise. Yeah, and I mean, if that happens, then everyone who runs in the future has to run on this fucking bullshit Russia hardline where we all have to pretend like we want, like it's valiant for us to support Nazis in Ukraine and whatever fucking kleptocrat asshole and whatever former Soviet satellite state to put a no fly zone in Syria. Yes, I know that Trump is also has some harebrained plan for Syria, but. It would it would present this default for foreign policy that would be even worse than what we have now because we'd have to play up these bullshit tensions. I mean, would I be surprised if okay. Ru- if it turned out, yeah, that Russia helped them? Absolutely not. It probably did. But I mean, OK, Israel does way more over the line shit all the fucking time as far as interfering with our politics. And just no, none of these fucking assholes who cry treason give a fuck. Well, Israel's our ally and best friend and are basically our sister country. Um, I, however, I do want to say the one, the one line that was uh, trending from that, again, just surreal press conference is when he casually threw off the phrase uh, nuclear holocaust, <laughs> which really I don't ever want to hear an American president say that phrase under any no, circumstances. No, no, it's good. He was warning about how bad they But that's are. the he thing. Was saying, in, to, he was saying to, uh, that they are like no other. He, he was, was saying, right, yeah. He was saying that that would be a bad thing. Yeah. Like no other. Like, which, you know, yeah, yeah. I, hard to argue with that. But again, you can't take any anything of this he said seriously because almost immediately or prior to that, he said, the best thing I could do as president is just blow off their boat that's off of Connecticut right now. Like okay, apparently yeah. Russia well, he has some shit. Strong, he was he made he said so, some of that was not gibberish. Basically, that for his for the best thing to do with this cloud of Russian collusion hanging over him would be to basically take a super hard line against Russia to prove that he doesn't have any connections to them. Right. And I guess that you know what I mean. He's a moron, but that's not wrong. I don't yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. the thing is, I mean, watching that, watching because I do think that. Him being an incompetent, easily distracted oaf is better than, you know, clear-eyed reptiles in the White House. At the same time, I watched that whole press conference, and it is just – it is so upsetting at a basic level that this is what's come to this. Uh, It's so nauseating. And I understand, yes, yes, America is a sham, blah, blah, blah. All these institutions are bullshit, obviously – and it's one thing to think that, though, and it's another thing to watch this just cretin, this TV cretin up there uh, just basically having a stroke on national television. And it does make you it, – it's like your white blood cells get anxious and it's just you want to reject it. You want to get it out of the body. And yeah, you know, there's a degree to which to do that you're sort of – ignoring the underlying condition that allowed him to breed in you, you know? But at the same time, that desire, that visceral desire to just get him out uh, is real. But I I have to stress that even when he's gone, however it happens, even if it's just he finally, you know, gets voted out or he does eight years, we'll never be the same. Like, we're, it's like we're, it's like the stretched out neck of a, of a, of a turtleneck that somebody with a big head wore. <laughs> it's never going back. It's That's never going back. I... And we're never going to be the same place. These institutions can never have the same meaning that they once had once this guy has befouled them. And he's sort of uh, now 
war on the press as well. I mean, again, I'm saying war on the press in quotation marks because the way they're reacting to it, I think, is incredibly hypocritical and self-serving where it's just like, oh, now they're waking up that they have this like adversarial relationship with power because he's calling them stupid and liars. And it's just like, well, where the fuck were you before? Why are you even going to these press conferences? And we were talking about this before we came on 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 air, but like this thing now where like everyone wants to make like the New York Times, like, you know, uh, part of the resistance in the same way that like undocumented immigrants are and people are like buying them pizzas for their newsroom because the president said they're enemies of the people or whatever. It's like, give me a fucking that's break. A, that's the funniest thing. Uh, like imagine like, uh, all right, guys, good work. We, we, we raised twenty thousand dollars to send pizza to the New York Times. Actually, we're getting word that the pizza is too sharp and too hot for Michael Barbaro. <laughs> we're uh, we're putting money together to get a softer food for Mikey. Yeah, and it's so it's pathetic, especially because the only thing that was as nauseating as Trump's performance during that press conference was the fucking questions he was getting from these just dickless whiners in the press corps. Every question was either about Russia. And this pursuit of a gotcha that they're never going to get from him or defending their own institutions against him. Yeah, you know, and nothing not- about the Yemeni raid, nothing about uh, deportations, just like, hey, hey, you're saying mean things about us uh, or like a sad attempts to, to fact check him in the middle of it. None of it. Yeah, I mean, it, it did not give you any. Uh, it should not have left you with the idea that this is any sort of resistance axis. Yeah, I mean, Trump did like he like planned a raid in Yemen with a mouthful of meatloaf with Jared, <laughs> like just the worst ideas he could have had. Like totally fucked it up. Killed a nine year old girl. Killed thirty civilians. Just completely got a precious operator. A precious too. operator. Those don't grow on trees. There aren't operator trees you can have. But because it's like. I mean, it was about as bad as, like, most of the drone operations in Obama's first year, to be honest. And this is not a thing that the press gives a shit about. And then, I mean, like Matt said, their defenses of the press aren't really about, like, oh, well, this is an institution. There has to be an adversarial adversarial press. This is a chilling effect on free speech. It's mostly, like, you said mean words to us. It's not even this institutional defense. It's just the continual backpatting that has gone on with the press since November 9th combined with their fucking bullshit hurt feelings. Well, and it, and it's like, and we talked about this before, but like, you know, the, the, the catchphrase, like fake news, the way that that was like introduced, then bent back on itself and folded into like a black hole of stupidity in record time is just amazing. And now he has like a little phrase that his moron base can apply to literally any piece of information that like conflicts with their veneration of this fucking idiot. And... Again, I sort of feel like, I mean, it's it's ridiculous that we now, like, there's really no objective standard anymore. But, like, I got to say, it's sort of the media's fault. I mean, like, they have been lying to people for years. And there's a reason why nobody trusts them and that someone like Trump can just get away with this blatantly. And even being corrected in real time can just brush it off. You know, like, that whole thing about how he won more electoral votes than anyone. And he was being corrected in real time. And then he just said, oh, well, it's just something someone told me. <laughs> You know, like, <laughs> rules. He's, like, he's lying to the press. Is like, well, I'm actually a stupid child who repeats anything well, yeah, that I'm told. I mean, how else are you supposed to process that explanation? Yeah. Like, I, I have no idea who what electoral votes are. Yeah, Someone I'm told actually, me that I got the most. I'm also president, and that's yeah. supposed to be. Oh, never mind. That makes sense. Yeah. I, I actually, I have the Holland Tunnel in my fucking brain. And I spend most of my time thinking about how I tried to fuck TV host 10 years ago when my dick still worked. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, this is just something someone told me, but I am president. I mean, it's kind of like it speaks to like the problem with satirizing him. It's hard to satirize his behavior because he does everything that we jokingly said he would do. He's literally done it all. He planned a fucking counterterrorism it, uh, operation with Jared Kushner. Like you can't really get much farther than <laughs> you, that. You made what he does... No, 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 no. Turn around the wall. Use no dude. dude, dude. Go into bullet time. Well, apparently they had a fucking meeting when Netanyahu was in town and Kushner was there and no one from the State Department was there. Bizarre. Because he is running all Israel Palestine stuff through Jared. That's so awesome. Through a 36 year old dipshit fail son. Who, who again? Who, his dad who, needed to spend who literally, million dollars to get him yeah, to Harvard. Who literally went to Harvard because his dad gave them several million dollars. Yeah. Um, 
But like I, I, my favorite line from the press conference is when Trump said again, and just like he's just riffing. It's great when he said, "We're becoming a drug infested nation. Drugs are becoming cheaper than candy bars." <laughs> again, I, I I don't what like he thinks candy bars cost like a hundred dollars. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that well, that's but bar. that's what's so funny. Like, I mean, everything about him just it just makes anything you used to understand as what counted just dissolve. Because remember when George H. W. Bush lost in in 1992 uh, for two reasons: one, he checked his watch during a debate, and, and the milk. Two, and yeah, he didn't understand what a checkout uh, machine was. Uh, oh yeah, like, scanner was. Yeah, he, he was he was baffled by the scanner. This is a guy who has never like he's he's never flushed his own toilet in his entire <laughs> life. You but, uh, know, like it's, there's no you could not be less connected to regular Americans' concerns than this fucking asshole, and it doesn't matter at all. Like everything people thought, all the all the like uh, the the ritualistic sort of bending towards regular norms. Nobody needs that. If you're gold plated and you've been on TV long enough, you have a brand that transcends every ritual that you're supposed to go through to become an acceptable candidate. I mean, that's the funny thing is when like people think they're scoring this huge point when they post a picture of Trump on like his gold airplane or whatever. (laughs) And they're like, oh, yeah, this is a regular guy. Well, it's like, yeah, no shit. America has zero class consciousness. And it's like these people who these people who happily trotted out Democratic Party lines for 15 years uh, are like shocked that we have no class consciousness in this country. Sorry, just uh, back to the the candy bars thing. And like, this is just a note about his relationship with the press. I just sort of came across this by accident because I searched Trump candy bars because I wanted to get the exact quote. And this is from the Washington Post wonk blog. Uh, my homepage. <laughs> the headline is Trump is right. Drugs are often cheaper than candy oh, bars. Fuck off. And this is by Christopher Ingram. And again, it's like these people, you know, they feel under attack, but yet they like, you know, within the sort of media hive mind and certainly the Washington Post, they cannot resist their like, you know, natural urge to be contrarian or toady to power. So like this is so fucking dumb. Listen to what Christopher Ingram says here in this moronic like pro fact check of Trump. He says Uh, While the remark was ridiculed on Twitter, there's a fair amount of truth to it. Illicit drugs are often incredibly inexpensive, particularly per dose. This is his example. In 2015, for instance, the Baltimore Sun reported that peewee capsules of heroin were selling for about $6 per dose on one West Baltimore street corner. That's not much more than the price of a a 12.6 ounce bar of Toblerone at Target which is probably less than what you account for taxes, which drug dealers typically don't charge. Um, typically. Yeah. Some of them do, of course. That, that's not much more than. Uh, another way of saying it is that's quite a bit more. Yeah. Um, but yeah, also, that's another word for less than. Yeah. yeah. That's <laughs> another word for incorrect. I'm sorry. Boom. That was a wrong statement. Christopher Ingram, Oops. a fucking 12.6 ounce Toblerone is not a fucking candy bar. Okay. Uh, one. A Twix is a candy bar. A Twix, a Snickers is a fucking candy Snickers. bar. It's a dollar fifty. Those are two tops. bucks. I love these. Tops. I love these people who every time in their life someone has as much as like smoked K two have sprinted out of the room and called their parents <laughs> writing about drugs. By the way, yeah. This guy's never even met anyone who knew anyone who did heroin. He's 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 coughing off that lounge. <laughs> yeah, he's smoking that. <laughs> <pinch>. <laughs> Loud bloons. <laughs> He's smoking a <laughs> huge blount. Yeah. <laughs> you can see the difference between a real cigarette and marijuana. Now, in the language the addicts use among themselves, marijuana is referred to as Mary Jane, pot, weed, or tea. They never say to each other, let's smoke a marijuana cigarette. They say, Let's turn on, or let's blast a joint. Commissioner, don't you think that you're magnifying this issue? Mr. Burroughs, please understand, Miss Williams, like many of us, believes in the progressive theory that there is no such thing as a bad boy or girl. Marty's story is like many of the others. It started with marijuana cigarettes. Several weeks later, after smoking reefers, Marty's befogged brain hit on a clever way to open pop bottles.
later, Stan went to the hospital for swallowing broken glass. Marty badly cut the inside of his mouth, though he didn't even know it at the time. Before long, Marty was hooked, physically dependent on heroin. Nothing mattered but the ever-present craving for the drugs. He had given up interest in everything else. But you know, the thing is, is I, like fact-checking him and like getting hypocrisy, it's no good for trying to change anyone's mind. No it's a mind base coin. By pointing out that they're hip- hypocrites. But that doesn't mean, one, that it doesn't elucidate just how irrational people's political views are. I mean, like, you had people who spent eight years in a frothing fury at the idea that taxpayer money was going to fund Michelle Obama's evening gown budget or something like that, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, don't, don't, don't. People that were woman just is wearing clothing. Matt, people went insane. The tax money. People went insane that there was going to pay for her vegetable garden in yeah, the fucking oh, White House. The vegetables paying. Oh my god! And now, like, he's just he's just obscenely wasting money. Like going to fucking Mar-a-Lago every weekend. He's already playing golf all the time. He's letting <laughs> club members of his chintzy fucking golf club in Florida <laughs> literally sit in on cabinet meetings. I mean, yeah. look, I believe in the ownership society. And look, if you're a Cadillac dealer who can afford a six-figure club fee and you like to say the N-word, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to hear classified briefings. You should there's be able to no make policy. I can't, wait till he, I can't wait till he auctions off the ability to press the button on a drone strike. The, Oh, I mean, no that's going to happen, right? He would do that like, to that's impress gonna be a, someone that's gonna in a golf cart. Mar-a-Lago, that's going to be a Mar-a-Lago uh, uh, perk at some point. They're going to bring one of those trailers from Nevada and park it by the 18th green. <laughs> I and mean, then I'm, after, you, after you finish your round, you can go in and get behind the stick and blow up a Yemeni wedding. I, and what we know about him, it doesn't take that cool of a person to impress him. Yeah. Like, he confessed to sexual assault to Billy Bush to sound <laughs> cool. So if, like, if fucking, if, like, he saw Chris Hardwick or someone, he would be like, <laughs> uh, do, hey, Chris, do you want to, uh, do you, do you want to murder 5,000 people? Do you want to call, call in an A-10 warthog strike? I mean, but, I, like, the, the, that blatant hypocrisy of those people, like, it. And pointing it out will never make them change their mind nah. because it was never about – they never really mad about the dress. They were really never mad about tax fair money. They hated the person for whatever like deep-seated, unexamined cultural reasons and then they just found a way to express it. Right. And like – so it's instructive – the kind of hypocrisy is instructive because it shows you how little rationality goes into people's political views – which is a lot something a lot of people need to keep in mind. And the other is it doesn't mean it doesn't stop me from getting furious about it. Right. Which is I need to do something because I'm just I read this stuff like somebody uh, found a tweet from two years ago from Trump going, but Obama he needs to stop spending millions of dollars flying Air Force One around for fun. And like he's going to Florida every weekend, and I want to punch through the fucking t- computer screen even though I know it means nothing. And, like, that's the real mindfuck of this Trump thing is that, like, at, at every level, I'm trying to remember, like, my materialist analysis of American society. And then the spectacle of him just pulls me out and makes me just mad at him at this level of just, you know, pure personal annoyance that has nothing to do with, like, what, quote unquote, is really going on. But it's so... It's just such a surreal fucking carnival. Well, my favorite. I can't pull myself out of it. Trump has spent thirty million dollars on blister packs because it soothes Barron to open and close them. <laughs> <laughs> we need look, folks. Uh, Barron needs more small locking mechanisms. He loves them for whatever reason. <laughs> I mean, Matt, my, my favorite are the, the MAGA people who are, of course, incredibly impressed by his wealth and business experience who are, you know, in the midst of, let's be honest, one of the most ridiculous beginnings of a presidential administration ever are All just time. like, are just like, this is what it feels like when the adults are in charge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> they're like running America like a business. Yeah, <laughs> I mean it is run. It's run I mean, like a business. I, that's true though. They're it's like, run like a small business owned by a cokehead. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly what the country is like now. It's the country operates completely on greed, petty grudges, uh, just insane issues from your childhood that you never yeah, worked out. I mean, dude, out like, I'm, I'm, wait, Dennis I'm, I'm getting annoyed. I'm getting annoyed trying to run our LLC. Me like, too, imagine yeah. we were running the fucking country like we're trying to do this fucking show. Boys, we got to start doing cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> done and yeah, done. done yeah. <laughs> I actually don't. It's haram. <laughs> me. But uh, yeah, I love I love the Mar-a-Lago thing. I love that like all these new White Houses that are just cropping up because that's where he wants to be. And Matt, yeah, you had a, you had a line that really stuck with me where you're like, he's deciding U.S. policy towards North Korea, which basically decides the almost the entire security uh, defense policy of Japan, which they rely on. Just sitting outside uh, on a nice golf course next to. Just tourists stuffing wedge salad in their mouth. It's so cool. Yeah, like people taking pictures of them and the table and putting them on Facebook. Dude, did you see the guy it's, who put, took the just, photo on Facebook of the guy who has the the nuclear football? It was my favorite thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, we keep coming back ever since November eighth. We keep coming back to No Country for Old Men. But the quote that keeps getting me uh, with this shit since he's actually been sworn in is what the El Paso Sheriff says to Ed Tom Bell about Chigurh. It's just beyond everything. <laughs> I like, I, I, you know what I always it's go just, That's all you. that I end up thinking. Like when this shit happens, it just like overwhelms my ability to process it. And I just end up thinking, <laughs> well, it's just beyond everything. You know what I always go back to thinking of is when Trump made that like dumb military speech in San Diego near that base. And there is this, these SEALs were driving this fighting vehicle around. They had Trump flags all over it. And it's like that rules so much that this fucking oaf with dementia who spends most of his time eating Big Macs and yelling at TV is like he's planning op- life and death operations around like a racist Cadillac dealer and a furniture wholesaler in Florida with no operational security and getting them all killed. <laughs> like, yeah, this is this is great. I want this guy to kill me. I want I want this guy to send me into any fucking country. I want a fucking pot of plant to explode and gr- just fucking shoot it to my skull because he planned it with a New York real estate fail son and I want my while I'm doing it I want my wife to be Skyping with a bracelet salesman <laughs> Trump I don't know I, I was thinking like the, the, the weird like vertigo like the, the, the disconcerting thing is this is you know you know we're, we're associated with the political left and you know radicals and have, you know I'm not a big fan of the American government or you know power in the world but I gotta say it is, a, but at the same time, much of my you know privilege and uh, comfort in life depends on those very things, which I'll be the first to admit. It is a little weird to just see American power in the world just implode in front of your eyes. I mean, I'm actually, I mean, he, we can't rule out the fa- the possibility that this is actually is all a long con, and Trump is actually a Maoist third worldist. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's just dismantling the American empire from the inside. Yeah. I look, I'm not privileged. I'm actually from the most marginalized group in America uh, the past eight years before this entrepreneurs. Right. But yeah, I mean, like, this is the way that American power is supposed to end. It started in a stupid way. It's going to end. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's like every, every, every it, it, this is, it, we are all in this sense of just denial and, and, and fantasia and, and, and surreal refusal to accept that this is reality. But like taking a step back, every current of culture and economics and, and technology really have brought us to this point. Everything from deindustrialization to the end of unions, fracturing of communities, the rise of television and the internet, celebrities, it all, the equation all pointed to Trump, but there was just no way of accepting that. Because the the structures seem so intact and and the the norms seem so self enforcing, and it I think we all thought that there would be more sort of warning signs along the po- the way, but the what we only got a few like Schwarzenegger winning, uh, Jesse Ventura, and we were able to sort of tell ourselves that it was isolated incidents, and then this happened and. What's scary for, for me is that you can do that, like look backward and see how all of these 
trends were pointing towards Trump. Uh, and you could even argue that, like, you know, modernist and postmodernist art in its entirety was all presaging Trump. Like, you can see the sort of insights into where we would end up in every commentary on American society before we got here. But all of it points to Trump, but nothing points beyond him. And that's what's the scariest thing is, <laughs> is this is surreal and insane. But there really, at this point, are no there's no guideposts for the future. Like it's going to be a different thing, but specifically what that form is going to take. I, I cannot even begin to fathom. Matt, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Cause I actually, in my notes, I, uh, I have this quote that I, uh, I, I wanted to read and I think it speaks to what you were talking about. Uh, I posted about this a while ago. It's from uh, William S. Burroughs. It's something I came across uh, recently and uh, it really stuck with me. And I just want to read it on the show because I think it speaks to exactly what we're talking about here. He writes, We have a new type of rule now. Not one man rule or rule of aristocracy or plutocracy, but of small groups elevated to positions of absolute power by random pressures and subject to political and economic factors that leave little room for decision. They are representatives of abstract forces who have reached power through surrender of self. The iron-willed dictator is a thing of the past. There will be no more Stalins, no more Hitlers. The rulers of this most insecure of all worlds are rulers by accident. Inept, frightened pilots at the controls of a vast machine they cannot understand, calling in experts to tell them which buttons to push. Now, that, that's a chilling thought. And, you know, when you read it, it's just like, oh, old uh, William Lee, uh, Mr. Doom and Gloom, once again. But, Matt, to your point about how we can see how everything has led us to this point, but we can't see beyond it. And that's, that's dark and it's very frightening. But also keep in mind that in this new, you know, rulers by accident, where it seems like history is opening up in a way that we haven't experienced before, at least not in our lifetimes, I think... If, if this is true, I think there's every reason to believe we could end up with a socialist government by accident or something dr- dramatically different but better than what we had before. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I think experience with how things have gone to this point and sort of the natural pessimism that that cultivates leads you – certainly, I mean, it leads me anyway to the fear and, and, and terror at the prospect of a totally unknown and uncharted future. But you're hundred percent right that we cannot underestimate the, the liberatory forces that are being unleashed by the collapse of these old certainties and systems that, that really were doing so much work to retard progress and, and make, uh, thinking about socialism, uh, or any kind of, uh, progressive break from tradition impossible. I think now people are thinking about it more than ever, partially because, you know, the rule that they followed led them to fucking Trump. And thankfully, that's leading them to sort of uh, think about what the real implications of that are. So yes, it could go well. Who knows? Let's hope so. For all of our sakes. And well, certainly a, for anyone posit- who's dumb enough to have a kid. <laughs> that's a positive note, slightly. But, you know, okay, so that's how sort of like Trump and the the the, poli- the weird politics of now have sort of colonized reality. But I, I don't want to let the show go too much further without talking to you, Matt, about some of the ways in which our uh, fantasy lives are now being colonized by uh, the world we live in or how they're reflecting it in a certain way. And, of course, I'm talking about television and uh, some research that you've done, some uh, important work into a, a new a new program on on the Fox network uh, that I'm, I'm hoping we can uh, discuss for a little bit. Uh, yeah, okay, so I, I'm sure everyone has seen trailers for the show. They, they added they pimped it a bunch during the um, during the Super Bowl. Uh, and it's a show called APB. and it t- debuted two weeks ago uh, on Fox and I watched it and it was exactly as insane and horrific as I thought it was going to be. Uh, so if you saw any of these commercials, you know that the basic premise is that a Silicon Valley billionaire's friend gets killed in the south side of Chicago. And he uses his money to basically buy control of a precinct and then basically disrupt it using uh, Silicon Valley technology and know-how. What if Peter yeah. Thiel ran a police department? 
If, if that's basically it, yes. Or or it's like RoboCop if Bob Morton was the good guy. <laughs> uh, like that's that's the premise behind this show. Uh, the pilot and- centers around using an Amazon Dash button to order more broom handles. <laughs> <laughs> <I know. laughs> uh, and of course, the, the most sobering and horrifying thing is that it's inspired by a true story. Uh, really? There was yes. There was this. Uh, there's this real estate dickhead in New Orleans whose uh, pied-à-terre in the French Quarter got burglarized, and he didn't. He wasn't happy with the response from the uh, New Orleans Police Department, so he created a police startup. It's like a private police force that people could subscribe to that used an app to report crime. They're like, we have nefarious types coming over the Danzinger Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tag uh, yourself now. Yeah, tag them with fucking uh, yeah. shotgun shells. <laughs> withering uh, gunfire. Withering, withering gunfire. Uh, and so that's just as tor- that as horrifying as that is, the idea that some dickhead at Fox saw it and was like, you know what? That'd make a great TV show. Let's just pump the ideology right into people's veins. Uh, to so Felix's calling- joke, uh, I-, I like the idea of like the tech dipshit like he spends a billion dollars and takes over like one police precinct and like on his first day he's just like everything here is so old fashioned why do you have all these phone books we don't need those anymore (laughs) everything's on your phone now and they just roll their eyes and they're like this guy Uh, so the show's called APB which is not it's not even one letter away from app it's a half a letter it's the curve at the end of the B away from being app which I can't imagine is a coincidence. First thing you see is like an ad for this guy's tech company. His name is Gideon Reeves. Uh, and it's really, it, it does look like something from a RoboCop movie, like like sort of a joke about uh, drones. And he, he unveils to this like collection of oil sheiks, these mini drones that can be used to put out oil well fires. And it very much feels like the scene in Iron Man where Tony Stark goes to Afghanistan to unveil, unleash his... Uh, his latest smart uh, bomb cluster bomb technology, the smart bombs. He really is. He's like the character is supposed to be a, a Silicon Valley guy, but he, the character's traits are much more like Tony Stark. Uh, he's like a smart aleck, wisecracking genius type. And that's the thing. He is not like all these other Silicon Valley dickheads who are just a guy with a, who had a terrible idea on how to arbitrage Asian slave labor you know, with the help of technology that was all developed with, by the U.S. government. He is one of these guys who's like an actual genius who actually invented the stuff, which, of course, is not like any of the actual ones who are on Silicon Valley. But, like, those guys are – I think people understand that those guys are essentially uh, uh, parasites, and so they want to give you a version of that where the guy is there through his own merit. But as we all know, that's bullshit. They, none of them are like that. So he's driving on his limo with his best friend, who's a black dude. So he's like, he literally like Rhodey, like James Rhodes from Iron Man, like Don Cheadle. I mean, he's, they basically recreated that dynamic. Only he goes into a, a convenience store and there's a robbery and Rhodey gets killed. And that's when he decides that there has to be a better way to fight crime. So he goes to before the mayor and he basically says, you've got a pension fund gap of like a hundred million dollars for the police department. I'll pay the whole thing. If you let me take over this police precinct, or if you say no, I will take the money and spend it on whoever runs against you in the next election, which, you know, that's, that's all good stuff that you want to see. (laughs) I'm going to take all that money and give it to chief Keith. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But the best part is, is like they talk for a bit about budget cuts and how like, Part of the reason that the police aren't as effective as they could be is, is they don't have the money. And no, at no point is it like, well, wait a minute. Guys like this are the reason that they don't have any fucking money because all of their money is in offshore tax havens. But anyway, so he gets control of this thing and he introduces the, the skeptical street cops to his brilliant ideas. Him and his assistant, who's a chick with like Skrillex hair and tattoos, you know, <laughs> so it's like. We're, we're, we're disrupting everything. Uh, and he actually refers to policing as, quote, an engineering problem. 
I mean, it is. It's, it is. It's it, just the ideology is, is, is very. It's pure. It's uncut. How does he actually disrupt policing on the south side of Chicago? Okay. So he introduces all this stuff to the skeptical cops. The big one is an app. It's an app that they're going to put on billboards to tell people to download so that they can report crimes. And uh, the really does the premise really is, and because in the in the episode it ends up working. The premise seems to be that they think the show's presumption is the reason that people in these communities don't call the cops is because they don't want to go on. They don't want to like the same reason people want Uber. They don't want to talk to an operator. You know, like they think that's why people aren't calling the cops because of crime in their neighborhood. If they had an app, they would do it. That's the cops theory actually. It. Cops. If, if there was an app that let you snitch anonymously and safely, then uh, they would. So then he also gives them advanced body armor that basically just makes them look like the cops from Minority Report. Uh, and then this high tech taser that like shoots a taser bullet so it goes like longer distance to tase somebody. Uh, and this is where you can kind of tell that they really did watch RoboCop for inspiration because the gun really looks like RoboCop's gun. It's got the big, long uh, barrel with the vents and stuff. Uh, and then he, he unveils a new police car that's like s- totally bulletproof. Was so this really a like problem, all, though, before? Yeah. That like cop cars are these, being like shot up these things, Swiss cheese too well, much? Well, here's the thing. Like those are, all, those are all sort of the – those are all like just the taste. That's like the stuff. Those are the goodies for the – the street cops that they can enjoy. The real game changer with the app are drones. Okay. And he, and, and that is like the meat of the episode is like they hunt down the guy who killed his friend and he's got hostages in this building and they literally send a drone through the window to like take disarm him. Uh, and then the guy runs away and he gets into a car and the car he drives off in the car and the cops who are chasing him, lose track of him, but the drone doesn't. And the drone, follows him to where they can get it. Uh, so, yeah, it's basically about <sighs> how drones and apps are the future of law enforcement. Uh, it's uh, very good. And, <laughs> are you going uh, to keep watching I that? Wait, watch. well, I think I might watch some more. I want to see, like, what, what else the drones can do. Like, can the drones help with, yeah, like, t- attaching electrodes to guys' balls during the interrogation uh, part? It'll be interesting to see. He's All like, right. he's like, this is, okay, disruption 2.0 chicago police department 2.0 let's have a precinct that we don't tell anyone about <laughs> let's have a precinct where we can take people and we, we don't we don't register them we don't officially arrest them we don't fingerprint them we just take them to a room and we disrupt all right we, we disrupt their their breathing their uh, their heart rate and uh, bones all right all, all right officers as you know some uh, anti-disruption forces, let's say, on city council have mandated that you need to wear body cameras. But there's a live streamer who's recently run into some publicity trouble. Meet your new <laughs> fellow officer who's going to be live streaming with you with through his body cam, PewDiePie. <laughs> <laughs> I got to say, if, if, I did, if I did a murder and you put me in, in the box with PewDiePie... For five minutes, I would confess to everything. Yeah, no, that <laughs> this is the end of the episode. They just pin every unsolved murder on one guy because PewDiePie. It's just is like I don't want, I don't want to watch him make noises while he plays yeah. a fucking uh, portal anymore. Let me out of here. Epic uh, monkey cheese. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, you cannot count to six million. <laughs> back to our uh, uh, looping back around to our original topic again. I think it's. Uh, I think it's hilarious how every uh, MAGA chud now has to pretend that they love PewDiePie it's and always so funny. has. It's so funny. Just this just Swedish child who's like, eh, the, the, the cake is a lie. <laughs> You're like, this is great comedy. This is the best shit I've ever seen. This is like sort of a digression, but like, why are all YouTube personalities so, so fucking bad? Like... I actually like people were requesting the other day that we do a show about like all of these like YouTubers, like these sort of reactionary, like who's that guy? Like, like Sargon of Akkad yeah, or whatever. Yeah, he's a fat IT guy who named himself after a pre-Babylonian conqueror. <laughs> like, yeah, and he's another one of these dickheads yeah. who only any, people only listen to him because he's got a British accent. So they think yeah. he must be intelligent. 
I've never I've never heard of like any of these people because it just seems like they record like two hour YouTube videos of them like pedantically discussing logic and like why social justice warriors are bad. And there's this one guy that someone showed me who's just called the Internet Aristocrat. And it's literally oh, yeah. just a still image of like his face with like like a to- like a powdered wig from like the 18th century on and with like headlines with like here's the thing about it, social justice warriors. And I'm like, why the fuck would anyone watch this? I'm, I'm doing the exact thing David Hume would do, which is to make a three and a half hour long video about age of consent tyranny. <laughs> you know, someone should tell him, like, you don't get to call your, you don't get to say you're the internet aristocrat. If you really believe in aristocracy, you either are born the internet aristocrat or you're not. I think calling yourself Sargon the of Akkad, who is like a badass Mesopotamian conqueror, that is the sickest type of stolen valor. You're just <laughs> literally a fucking fat pedant who's had through sex well, three I mean, that's times the in his life. Thing is, like, these guys, I'm Sargon. These guys, their entire thing is lamenting sort of the the, the lack of masculinity thanks to. Feminist. Uh, modern techno culture and their entire existence is predicated on it. Like none right. of them would last for a second in any kind like, of I, again, you know, Darwinian I don't, world. I do like, I really just a joke. All I knew about him was that it, like his dumbass name and that like his Twitter profile pic used to be him smoking a cigar. Alpha. So it's like that's pretty much all I need to know. Like why the like what like what what is there further to discuss? He's like he's like cuz when I see some guy when I see some fat asshole with a cigar sticking out of his mouth, I think dangerous rebel. I immediately look for things to discredit him childishly to make fun of his name or his profile picture. Or the fact that he's made 19 four hour videos about how uh, PewDiePie is being persecuted uh, to avoid the crucial logical attacks he's issuing at my worldview. Anyway, uh, probably not going to happen because I just I just don't want to watch any of these videos like it's just they seem too excruciating to sit through even like for comedy purposes dude they just are stick really to long. Demonious X dude Demonious X was the best like <laughs> all these guys are biting off Demonious X Demonious X invented being a fat reactionary guy who complains into the camera and he was so much better and is still so much better than all these guys I mean Demonious X changed because he got woke I mean, he really didn't get woke. He just said, like, uh, the, the racism shit, I'm done with it. I'm still a misogynist, though. <laughs> but that's what happened to all of us. That's why we have a show, because we're done with the racism, but we're still misogynists. And anyway, all every dollar that these assholes make should go directly to demonious X, because that man is an auteur. Is he yeah, he's like, it's like how little Richard would always, was always bitter because all of the rock and roll people stole his style. Yeah, and he wanted he wanted residuals. Yeah, they should be giving that money to him. Uh, I don't want to let too much more time go. Uh, what do you say? What, let's let's do this reading series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do this reading series, guys. It's uh, it's a really good one. This is uh, again, this is back to Trump, but like this is a subset of Trump. And the reason I'm interested in this in in this selection, uh, this week's selection, is because it speaks to the sort of intellectual class of conservatives that have, you know, disdained Trump but are now working overtime to ingratiate themselves to him and and create uh, and just sort of uh, fabric fabricate out of, you know, a sort of pre-made justification or for supporting him that makes it seem like there is some sort of intellectual reason to to be like, well, actually, no, I think what he's doing is very interesting in a Jacksonian tradition. Um, the the reading selection today comes to us courtesy of a guy named uh, Mark uh, Bowerlane. And he is a, uh, let me see here, he's an English professor at um, Mark, uh, Mark Bowerlane. And he is an English professor at uh, Emory University. And uh, he's on the edit. Uh, he writes for First Things magazine. Great sign. And he's a uh, a, Catholic, a religious Catholic who used to be a liberal. Hell yeah. And uh, he's like a liberal. He's a, he used to be a lib college professor, but he claims that because you know campus PC and just like uh, he's become a conservative because he's seen up close what you know liberalism and politically correct culture does. Which, if it's a college professor who is a middle aged man saying this. Read between the lines, uh, his students won't fuck him anymore, and it's because of feminism, and he is pissed. So anyway, uh, th- I-, I, found about- I found out about him through an interview in Slate.com with uh, Isaac uh, uh, Ch- Chonatier? Chotner. Uh, and I gotta say, uh, 
props to Isaac. He's, he's annoyed me in the past, but he did make uh, Mark Barrelane seem like a complete fool in this interview. Uh, you can link to that, I guess. I mean, he nothing he says makes any sense. I mean, it's absolute bullshit. But thanks to that, I found out that he wrote an article for First Things entitled, In a Tight Place with Profanity. And I read it, and it was so fucking good. It, like, it speaks to the sort of bow-tied intellectual conservative mindset in a way that I think is incredibly revealing and profound. It's short, so let's let's just do it all right now, guys. The title of the piece in First Things Magazine, In a Tight Place with Profanity, by former liberal turned Catholic reactionary Mark Bauerlein. It begins. Sometimes it's hard to know what to do, and sometimes it isn't. The other night, I had a flight to Atlanta and was lucky to get upgraded to business class. Right, right off the bat, uh, we have here like two big conservative tropes. One, uh, that doing the right thing is always easy and obvious, and uh, business class and f flying places. He says, it was late, I was tired, and the lights were low. People were reading, checking their phones, watching their tablets. I leaned back and drifted into half slumber until a voice exclaimed, Oh, man, that's fucking awesome. It, it was startling, and I wasn't sure who said it. It was Macklemore. <laughs> or whether it even happened on the plane or in my head. He was immediately thinking the guy who said, that's fucking awesome, is going to charge the cockpit with a fucking box cutter. <laughs> yeah. that's, that, that's like how Muhammad Atta got into terrorism, is through swearing. Yeah, no, well, actually, you remember, like, in the uh, the sort of months and years after, like, the, the immediate months after 9-11, if you took a flight, there'd always be like the one guy who just sort of nods at you. You'd just be like, buddy, I know you know. I know. If sh any shit goes down, we know what to do. We, you can we, count will, on we me. will assist the you hijacker <laughs> to punish the great Satan for their crimes <laughs> in assisting the Jews' colonization of the world. That's always what I would say. I'd be like, you I, know, agree with you, I don't know if this is widely known, but uh, the. The last words that Muhammad Atta said that are recorded on the on the black box uh, before he crashed into the World Trade Center was "fuck me up, fam." <laughs> <laughs> so M Mark is on the plane. He's drifting off to slumberland, and, to, and, to, and his peace is violently interrupted by someone exclaiming, "That's fucking awesome!" He says, uh, "I looked around and spotted two men across the aisle, one row back." They looked 30 years old, but wore the standard youth costume. Caps, <laughs> jeans, and nylon jackets. I mean, were we on that flight? I mean, he may as well have been it looking at us. It sounds like us, yeah. actually. Um, I, again, li I love that phrase. The standard youth costume. As opposed to the standard Catholic reactionary costume of spats, a walking stick, monocle... <laughs> Uh, opera hat. Uh, everything. Which these one, guys, which one of those guys would you rather sit down next to you on an airplane? Oh my God! The, everything these young people, these cool young people, wear is such an affectation. Hold on, my cape is caught in the toilet again. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, he's a guy who who literally wears a suit on the weekends. Yeah. He's like, the, 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 this is just my uniform. It's not a costume. Okay, so he says. He continues. Both of them focused on a small screen and laughed and jostled. The talking continued, most of it commentary on the action, whatever it was unfolding in front of them, and nobody seemed to notice the profanity 60 seconds before. So he sees like two just regular guys just watching something on their phone, a funny clip or something that they're enjoying passing the time on the flight on their phone. One of them says, oh, that's fucking hilarious or whatever. And he, he's like, nobody seemed to notice the, the mild F word someone said 60 full seconds ago. He, sh he doesn't know what to make of this at all. I mean, I, I do kind of agree with him. Like anything that's obscene should not be in public view. It should be hidden away. And the only way you can pry it out is through a class action lawsuit of several other people who were exposed to obscenity. And when they do get it out, you should move the people who did the obscenity to those people around to different parishes. <laughs> and you should never admit to it. That's how you should deal with obscenity. He says, uh, I let it go and shut my eyes once more, but couldn't help overhearing the conversation. Translation, couldn't help eavesdropping on this conversation. Everyone was quiet but them, and they didn't appear conscious that every word they said bounced throughout the cabin. Minutes passed, and their banter faded to background noise. It didn't take long, though, for another F-bomb to fall. Bow. It was certain to happen 
People burnt the word in the middle of an airplane ride apparently have no awareness of its impropriety. Really, the knowledge that you just don't talk like that way in a crowded space, they don't have it. Nobody has told them straight out that we still have remnants of decorum here and there, and that for all its popularity on the ball field, in the bar, <laughs> movies, and John Stewart commentaries, the F word remains an indignity now and again. They have to be told. <laughs> Where do you want to start with that? Uh, they have to be told. Something must be done. Uh, John Stewart commentaries, uh, asshole. That's on Comedy Central. They can't say the F word. Yeah, but they bleep it, and you know what they said. So that's basically oh right. That's just as bad. Forcing you to think of it. There is still remnants of decorum here and there. Uh, I'm I'm against that. I mean, I just think if you're an adult, you should curse. Yeah, cursing rules. I mean, <laughs> it's no fucking one awesome. It's no one hates. It's like that's how you know you're a grown up when no one can stop you from yell- saying a swear in public. It's no like, for, like for instance at the National Air and Space Museum, Matt. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like maybe you see somebody in a MAGA hat, you just go, you fucking chud at them. No one hid curses. So I, like, I, I like to think that I inspired at least one indignant blog post about the fucking says, feral uh, animals and the he, intolerant he, left of he, Washington, he D.C. He couldn't bear this indignity. They have to be told. And I, like, again, this is another conservative trope where you're building up in your mind these uh, incredibly minor and pathetic instances of scolding other adults as like this brave stand that you're making for p- p- civilized society and the West, God damn it. <laughs> but he says, uh, I jumped up, climbed over my neighbor, stepped across the aisle, leaned over. I mean, again, he's acting like more of an asshole than these guys are. Yeah, like, he, he didn't even ask to like, oh, excuse me, could you just uh, move for a little side? He, he just literally leapt over like <laughs> the aisle seat. He's like Batman. <laughs> he's the Dark Knight. He's the anti-obscenity Dark Knight. So he says, uh, I, I you know, leaned over and said, gentlemen, let's ease up on the F word. I would I would I was like seriously I, I would have lost my mind. Dude, if somebody did that to me, I would single-handedly cause them to double the air marshal program. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I'm in I an mean, airport. I, 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 I'm a soft boy. I would not have done violence to the man, but I can't imagine, especially considering that he would have would have looked like a wad of cookie dough in a fucking uh, vest. Dude, I probably would have said fuck off. Dude, imagine you're in the worst place you can be. You're on an airplane after going being in an airport for like two and a half hours. One of the worst experiences you can have as an adult. You've probably been in that fucking on that fucking terminal for like 30 minutes because now no one ever fucking takes off on time on the east coast and just this fucking cunt in a, in a trilby and actually, a cape no, look, and a look, walking look at a picture stick. of him actually felix look at a picture of let him let me show me show me sorry <laughs> fuck fuck i'm scrolling i'm scrolling uh, he's got his glasses in his oh, mouth looking pensively brendan <laughs> can you edit in the the clip from the thick of it where the guy tells Malcolm not to curse? I'm sorry. Can you stop? Can you stop swearing, please. Okay. Yeah. I'm really sorry. You won't hear any more swearing from us. You massive gay shit! Fuck off! <laughs> 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 no, that that would be appropriate in this situation. But he says, "Gentlemen, let's ease up on the f word." They turned their heads and stared. I stared back. One mumbled quietly, "You don't like that." I nodded and replied, just don't want to hear it. They said nothing more, and I returned to my seat. They continued talking, but kept it clean. I'm sure they thought of me as an uptight scold. <laughs> Whoa, Whoa uh, yeah. No, uh, not at all. <laughs> I can't believe they thought would have thought you were an uptight scold, Mark. But, but, he writes, I suspect they knew something was wrong with their language. They just needed to be reminded of it. In fact, the frustrating wow. thing about the episode wasn't its commonplace character. Who hasn't undergone the same thing? No, it was the passivity of the other passengers, people sitting closer to the pair and choosing to let the F words slide. They ceased not because I told them to, but because an outside voice activated an inside one, their conscience, which ordered them not to react or flout. Okay. Maybe. Here, no, wait, hold on a second. I just want to say, like, his line about what really bothered him was the passivity of the other passengers, I think speaks to the conservative mindset writ large. Like, this is really, this, I think, it just gets to the heart of their worldview. Because it's just like, they're constantly angry because they think the culture at large doesn't pay them the respect that they think they deserve. And what they get angry about is that, like, that they have to be the lone defender, that nobody else around them is as outraged as they are by completely normal things. 
Well, I guarantee you that in his mind, if this con- confrontation even happened, which I kind of doubt, frankly, uh, if he actually did have the stones to lean over and put his balls in someone's face just so that he could tell these guys to clean it up, mister, I assure you that he was waiting for a flight attendant to come back and be like, would you like some champagne? Yeah, yeah, you exactly. Or like, or like another uh, another person to be like, hey, buddy, nice job. They, you know, or they, like maybe even the slow clap of the whole airplane. They're just so everyone, they're so angered that nobody recognizes, yeah. you know, uh, their their bravery or genius, you know. Yeah. And it's the no way one it cares, just, bitch. It's, 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 it's like up. he's scolding the guy saying the f word, which is bad enough. But really, what he's doing, he's scolding all of society for letting things like saying the f word slide. The the guys actually didn't stop talking because you know he appealed to their conscience. They saw his Opus Day bracelet and it triggered a childhood memory. <laughs> <laughs> they spent the rest of the flight crying. They're just yeah, cowering yeah. in fear. No, the real reason is is that being on an airplane is one of the few places that a any kind of like uh, argument can turn into you getting arrested by federal marshals. Mm-hmm. So it's always better to just ignore insane people. I always, uh, when anyone says anything to me on an airplane, I all I say is like. You are lucky that I am on the restricted flying list. You're lucky I'm on Sky Parole, bitch. (laughs) (laughs) The closing paragraph here is, uh, when we hear obscenities in closed public places, we should recognize conscience as an ally against degradation. It lies fallow in the speakers, but the right prompting, not aggressive, just firm and polite, can incite it. Again, these people are professional scolds. They're scolds because essentially they have no personality of their own. They're completely blank inside and they won't rest until the rest of the world is exactly as boring as them. So fight back against them. And I got to say, Mark Barreline, uh, go on come town, bitch. Yeah, go on come town. <laughs> okay, that's uh, that's Chapo for this week. I hope you guys enjoyed uh this week's episode with uh, the original uh, Dry Boys. Um, Until next time.